Uh, good evening, everyone. Unfortunately, I can't hear you. Hopefully you can hear me. I'm Steve Cross. Um, I'm an all-round naturalist. And tonight we're going to be having a look at plant galls. What are they? What forms them? Where you, how you can study them? All those sort of things. Uh, most people probably will know about plant galls on things like oaks. You will see these sort of things you can see hopefully on the screen there. Things like the Napa galls and a whole range of different... Uh, things like oak apples and a whole range of things on on the leaves of oaks as well. So they're the sort of things we'd be going, talking about. But what really is a plant gall? Um, so the, that's the obvious first question. Well, what it really is, it's an abnormal growth uh, induced by another organism uh, that lives either on the plant or in the plant, and it causes the cells to enlarge and or multiply. And what the organism, of course, wants is that the provision of both food and shelter for that causa. So in a way, really, it's the organism is hijacking the plant to produce scores where the earth organism can live and feed and be relatively safe. That's the whole idea. It's providing the food, the shelter and the protection is what this is really all about. So that's in general terms what... Um, a plant gall is but the how does it actually do this well basically it's it's a chemical uh reaction really it's uh chemicals that are introduced into the plant tissues and the cells and um, perhaps with some mechanical damage as well it's actually stimulating a reorganization of the cells and then once that happens it grows into the gall form rather than the normal form for that plant it's it's hijacking of uh, the molecular sort of structure really and the principal ways of doing it is it's either uh, through uh, the salivary glands of the insect or whatever feeding on it or it can even be uh, when the, the insect lays eggs into the plant that can actually start the process even before the animal is inside there so it's it's basically manipulating the plant hormones what are called the phytohormones and the main ones it's affecting really what are called auxins and cytokinins, which are basically on the development of, of plants. Um, so as I mentioned, it's things like sawflies. It can actually, it doesn't even need the animal inside. Just the first job of the insects, uh, putting its egg tube into the plant and the whole process can start even from that, even though there's not a fertile egg inside there. Whereas some things like some of the gall wasps, they need uh, the constant uh, eating action of the larva to continue forming galls. If they disappear, the plant gall won't uh, continue to grow really is, is what happens in those situations. And where we have things like bacteria producing a gall, what they're actually doing is putting <coughs> DNA into the plant cells DNA and hijacking it in that way. So there's a whole range of forms for the different types of galls. There's different ways that it can actually uh, hijack the uh, plants to grow into a distinct different form. Um, so I've mentioned what galls are. You might see lots of things on plants mm -hmm. which you think might be galls, it might not. Um, but there's a few here that uh, we can see here that are not galls. So a thing called fasciation uh, is where a plant grows um, usually genetic or some physiological or development problems, it grows uh, in a quite different way. So there's an ordinary daisy and this fasciated one grows completely different. Um, so that is to do with the plant itself, not with something causing a gall. Um, various plants can have uh, diseases, fruits, for example, and stuff growing on it thinks maybe that's a goal because it, but it's not uh, getting the nutrients in the same way uh, and hijacking it in the same way so you wouldn't call that one a goal. Uh, you might see on sycamore leaves the thing called tar spot fungus and that seems to protrude a little bit out of the leaf um, but it is a fungus but it's not a goal forming <coughs> fungus uh, mm. even though it's protruding slightly out. Um, things like leaf mines, many uh, leaves you will see uh, that have a little insect inside, most, mostly either caterpillars or fly larvae, and some of them can actually produce sort of a little uh, raised area 
in the likes of the holly leaf mine, which this one is. Um, but the uh, insect larva, the fly larva, isn't taking okay. advantage of that. So in those cases, you wouldn't call it a plant gall. So there are things that you think might be plant galls, but actually aren't. Um, in terms of Britain, there's round about 1,100 gall formers in Britain of a whole range of different organisms that can actually do that. So it's actually quite a lot of things that actually will produce galls. Uh, at the most simple level, things like viruses, maybe around about 40 different viruses um, have either some sort of elongation or uh, reproduction of the uh, cells in a different way. So that can uh, class as a gall. And possibly some of the um, cone galls on willow that you see are possibly caused by virus. But there's still an awful lot not known about, about the gall causes and what's actually uh, producing a gall in that plant. There's still an awful lot not known. Um, there's a whole range of single celled organisms that can do it. Uh, bacteria, smaller again than them, are things called phytoplasmas. And with the rearrangement of all, lots of different single celled organisms, there's groups in that what we call protozoa and chromista that can form uh, galls in plants. Uh, but there's only about half a dozen of those. So the, um, relatively small group of gall causes. Um, round about 20 galls are caused by the eelworms, the roundworms, and they tend to be mostly in roots. Um, um, most people don't look down at roots unless they're a gardener or whatever and, and would come across those or as a farmer. But most botanists probably wouldn't be looking down at the roots uh, to come across those, but there's a relatively small number of those really. Uh, in terms of things like plants, uh, there's around about four or so, and they're all parasitic plants because they're taking the nutrients from the plant and they're causing a swelling that can then class them as a plant gall. So things like mistletoe, for example, uh, can be uh, can be characterised as, as a plant gall. There's a relatively small number of those, though. Uh, things like fungi, there's a range, mostly smuts, rust and things called tephrina, around about 180 uh, species of those that can call, uh, cause galls. Uh, the most obvious ones are things like on the campy and the smuts you can get on those or on nettle and things like that, various rust and things like that. Um, and of course they're called rust because of the orangey nature of the spores you get from those. The next big group uh, of gall causes is a thing called mites. Uh, it's a particular family called the erythiids, around about 180 or so, so things like nail galls, on sycamore and things like that are caused by mites, which of course are arachnids, they're a relative of spiders, They've got eight legs. Uh, but the biggest group really are the insects. There's maybe 700 or so of those. And um, the two big groups really, the gall midges, the type of fly, the gall wasps, which is related to bees and, and wasps and things like that, um, but rather tiny in comparison to those. Uh, there is various plant bugs uh, that will, uh, cause galls. The aphids, everyone knows they're green fly and things like that. There's some of those species that will uh, cause galls and a closely allied group, the psyllids or sometimes called uh, sucking plant lice, that will form galls as well. Um, things like beetles and various moth caterpillars, there's only a really tiny number of those that could actually cause galls. The galls can take various forms. It can be uh, swellings of part of the plant or big, some of the, them can be quite big lumps and things or a warty structure. Um, so they're the sort of thing, swellings in plants. You can, you can see if there's obviously something in there that's, that's growing and causing that gall. Uh, it can be the edge of leaves. It can be a swelling of the stem. There's a whole range of ways it can actually um, cause a gall in the form of that. But each form is characteristic of that particular species. Uh, it can fold the leaf. Some other some insects do fold leaves, but they don't produce a, a different structure in this way and a, and a different uh, form for that. So um, it's th it tends to be thickened. It's not just the leaf; it's a thickened edge to the leaf as well as being folded up with those leaf folds. Uh, on some um, plants, you can see it gives almost a felty surface, and it's almost like a sort of glass uh, hairs really. And this is the reaction to the mites, which pretend to, uh, tend to produce this sort of gall. And the little tiny mites are uh, feeding 
amongst those little tiny hairs uh, that we can see on here. Of course, the, possibly the most uh, characteristic form of gall are the woody nodules, you, the ones you see on oak, for example. So there, there's quite a lot of those on oak, especially. Um, but where on the plants are you getting these galls? Well, the leaves are probably the best uh, uh, thing to look for, uh, look at, really. Around about 65% of them are to, are to be found there. Stems, around about 20% of the galls are, are found there. Buds, possibly around about 10%. Whereas flowers, fruits, 3% and roots, 2%, a relatively small number of gall causes in, in those areas. So looking at the leaves of plants is, is probably your best bet to find the most leaf, uh, most plant galls. We'll go through some of the, the different groups and what sort of galls they can actually cause. Um, the, amongst the, the simplest, the, the, the bacterial ones, there's one called crown gall disease. And these bacter bacterial galls are actually quite amazing in that they can actually um, cause galls, in, in the case of this one, Nagrobacterium tumefaciens, in about 140 different plants, from massive trees to tiny little uh, herbaceous plants. It's, it's an amazing diversity uh, for this particular um, type of gall in such a vast range of different plants. Most galls tend to be on a particular um, group of plants, sometimes a single genus or a very small group anyway, usually. Uh, but these bacterial ones uh, can be on a whole range of different ones. Uh, the, if, you, if you get some of these bacterial ones on things like the silver birch, these big nodules are actually hard. They're solid inside these types of galls. Um, and some um, wood turn has actually made them into bowls. They've cut it off and turned it into, made it into a, into, into a bowl. So they, they can be used in that way. Uh, the other possibly uh, most famous sort of bacterial gall are the, the, the ones in the nodules on your legumes, which of course are, uh, a nitrogen fixing uh, bacteria and that's where they live so technically that is in a gall um, and, but of course that's producing the bringing the nitrogen into the members of the fee family and so they can help uh, fertilize a, an area and it's the bacteria within those nodules that are producing uh, getting that uh, extracting that nitrogen from the air but making it available in a, in a form that the plants can actually get at. Uh, for things like the plants, the parasitic plants, mistletoe is the most obvious uh, one in this group. Because if you see a piece of mistletoe just on a, on a tree or whatever, you only see the green leaves. But of course, underneath that is the stem of the, of the tree and it's swell swollen. Um, it has a sort of root system that goes into the system of the plant and uh, extracts the nutrients from, from the plant system. And so that's why this can be classed as a gall, the mistletoe is, is one of the plant galls as well. But things like dodder and a few other parasitic plants can also be classed as galls as well. Uh, one of the big groups that cause uh, these galls are fungi. Three main groups, the smuts, the rusts, and um, uh, a few others as well. But uh, the smuts are quite obvious. Um, only a few of the hundred or so we get in Britain are actually would be classed as galls. Uh, but the ones you get on the campions, both on red campion and white campion, instead of uh, producing pollen, you got this black mass of spores uh, occurring. Uh, a strange one is is on on is on maize. Uh, you get these grey sort of blotches instead of uh, your normal maize and cor corn growing on it. You've got these massive uh, uh, hijacked uh, seeds that have. Uh, just basically producing more spores of these smuts. Uh, there's around about 260 species of rust. Some are, um, are not uh, gall formers, some are. If it produces a swelling, and then there's the orange spores on top, we would class it as a gall. Uh, for some that don't do that, they, you wouldn't class them as galls, but they are affecting the plant. Um, some like the gymnast sporangium, uh, this one on the, on the right, um, they have sort of little nodules uh, on the on this one growing, um, and they're like um, many of these gall formers. They're actually alternating between different hosts. 
Um, with rust, it's a, it's a very complicated life cycle. Uh, there are often five stages producing spores and they can often be on different plant hosts. So alternating between different plants, it's a very complicated life cycle. Um, but it's it's fascinating once you start looking at these things, just um, they, they need one plant close by to another one. If they haven't got that, they won't survive. They need both uh, plants to, to enable to produce the life cycle. The biggest group are the invertebrates. Uh, gall wasps uh, don't really look very much like your ordinary uh, social wasps. They're very, very tiny, round bodied, and of course, the larva is, is encased inside one of these usually hard galls in the case of these gall wasps. Um, gall midges, a type of true fly, so it only has two wings compared to the four wings in the wasps, have sort of orangey coloured little uh, larva. Uh, there's another group common in things like thistles, uh, are the picture wing flies. Um, they're called picture wing flies, obviously, because of the patterning on the wing, and they have sort of whitey creamy coloured lava inside. Uh, there's two, two true bugs that um, can put, cause galls, the psyllids or uh, sucking plant lice they're sometimes called, again quite tiny and not too dissimilar to their close relatives the aphids which of course most people will know. Another hymenopteran that will uh, produce galls are the sawflies. The relatives of, of uh, these wasps and, and the true social wasp and bees and things but actually they're a quite a primitive group. Um, the body parts are quite different, um, but this is the one group where just the action of the female using her egg laying tube into the uh, willow in, in the case of most of these will actually start the gall forming even before the animals actively eating inside the uh, plant. Uh, the other group are the mites, which is of course the arachnids, the eight legged creatures, but they're very, very small. It's really microscope work. Uh, to look at those but the animals themselves look very similar but the galls can be completely different even though the animals themselves are so similar. Now as well as the proper uh, host, uh, the proper causer of the gall, there's also often lots of things living inside it. It can actually be a whole ecosystem inside one single gall. Uh, there are things that are called inquilines, which are basically lodgers. They go in, take advantage of the home and board and the food and things like that, um, but don't actually produce the galls themselves. They're just uh, taking advantage, really. So most of those are things like so the gall wasps, a few flies, will do that inside one of these galls. <clears throat> There's also a group called parasitoids. Um, we don't call them parasites. The difference between a parasite and a parasitoid is that a parasite will live on, an, on a, an animal or whatever and will take food and things from it, but it doesn't kill it usually. Whereas a parasite like these ones actually will actually kill the animal it's eating. eating. So it's, it's classed as a parasitoid. And many, many of these are, are types of wasps. Uh, so this image is, is of, a, of a wasp. You can see it's got a massive long egg laying tube. It's absolutely minute, um, these little tiny uh, wasps, but they use that tube for laying their egg into the uh, larva inside a gall. So they've got to penetrate through the gall and then penetrate into the body of the larva with inside that gall. But it gets even more complicated because there are things called hyperparasitoids, which actually lay their egg into the larva of the parasitoids of, paras of the then be feeding on, on the actual gall cause, cause or the inquilines within it. So it's a whole amazing ecosystem inside a, a single gall. Things like oak apples and marble galls, robin pigeons, these larger galls can have that. And there can be well over 100 insects within a single gall. Uh, this is a famous shot of um, an, a, an, an oak apple with 112 insect holes uh, where they've come out and the pins have been put in to show where all the different insects have come out. And it's there can be a whole host, maybe up to 20 species within one goal. It's quite amazing what can be happening inside this goal, but it's microscopic and mostly hidden to us, but it's a whole fascinating separate world inside 
these goals. Now, some uh, plant families uh, are quite rich in them. Um, the oak family, um, which includes, of course, oaks and beech, around about 60 species. The vast majority on, on those, not on the beech, they're on the oak. Uh, so include the marble galls and most of the familiar ones. Um, but also with that group, there's actually a lot turning up from the continent. Uh, new ones each year being found. Um, so it's, it's increasing year on year with that one as well. Um, with the roses, uh, the sort of obvious one that you may well know is the Robin's Pincushion or Bedigal Guar uh, Gall uh, on rose itself. But of course, it's quite a large family, the rose family. There's many plant species within the rose family. So consequently, there's quite a lot of uh, galls on them as well. And the same applies to the, the pea family. Like there's, again, lots of many species. And so you get various galls. And again, they can be on various parts. It could be on the leaves, on the flowers, the whole range of parts where they can be. So that's why you can get so many gall species within one family. And of course, the Asteraceae, the daisy family, is absolutely massive in terms of number of plant species. And consequently, there's lots of galls on them as well. Um, but the biggest single uh, genus in terms of number of species is Salix. Uh, there's nearly 90 species uh, on Salix itself, but also, of course, of course, of course uh, includes the poplars as well in, in that family, but over 90 species. So the biggest um, group on one particular genus of, of plants is, is on willows, including these bean galls on a willow. So there's sort of one, but there's, we said it was around about 1100 in total in Britain. If you want to study plant galls, the best thing is to be a botanist. That's the best way to do it. Because uh, the first stage really is to identify the plant. If you know the plant, you're often three quarters, sometimes even 90% of the way there to working out what the goal is. Because um, most of the books, uh, a couple here, which I'll talk about later, but um, they're basically um, done by plant. So if you can easily identify or readily identify the plant, you're well on the way to be able to ident identify the plant goal. So it's a good group to get into for, for botanists. Um, there, are, there is a specialist society, the British Plant Goal Society. So that's a, a source of further information and if people get interested in it, they can take it further through that. Various natural history societies and groups and things sometimes do goals on trips if they're doing general natural history or plants. I always do when I go out with Liverpool Botan Botanical Society, which I'm president of. If we see goals out on a trip, I will identify them for the group as well. Um, so I mentioned the British Plant Goal Society. It was formed in 1985. Even though it's called British Plant Goal Society, it actually has a wider remit and actually covers world uh, plant goals to some extent, but with particular reference to the British Isles. It produces a specialist journal twice a year called Kekodology. There's an example there on the, on the left and has been uh, twice a year since 1985. Uh, they also do things online. So there's a Facebook group. Um, so if you do social media, they will help you out to identify things and things like that. And they have a good uh, website, British Plant Goal Society. So it gives all about their events, the publications that produce some of these in the top left of some of their uh, publications. Uh, you can also uh, search uh, for goals by a particular host. So again, being the bottom, you can go through the list and of the plant that you found a goal on, and you may be able to find it that way. Uh, my favourite book of them all is uh, a photographic guide. It's uh, Britain's Plant Guides. Um, it's in the Wild Guide series. It's by Michael Chinnery. It's a photographic guide. There's 96 pages. It covers around about 200 of the most common goals that you're going to come across. Um, so it's it's nicely laid out. First third, roughly, of the book is, is all the ones you get on oak. The, the middle third is, is on the plant you'd get on other trees and shrubs. And then the herbaceous plants cover the last third of the book. But it's very much looking at the pictures and the simple notes with it. Um, the Bible for sort of people who are interested in, in plant goals is the Field Studies Council's Aid Gap Key, plant goal, British plant goals. Um, covers over a thousand of the, of the plant goals. Again, it's the way it's structured is that it's actually um, you basically it's, it's you, you need to know the 
it's done by genus. So, for example, you can uh, go to Persicaria and then work through the key to work out which one. Some plants only have one gall on them. Some like the oaks and, and the willows, you've got about uh, 30 or 40 couplets of the key to go through to work out what it is. But again, there's illustration to help with that. If you want to see the background, the biology and its sort of cultural side and hope, but just the basic background on, on plant goals, uh, Margaret Redfern's New Naturalist Guide by Collins uh, in the Collins series is, is a good read in that respect. Um, they're the sort of current ones really, but um, uh, from 1968 till the 80s, the, the plant um, was by Arnold Darlington. It's a bit dated now, um, but even before that, it was you'd have to go back to the 1910s for a book on plant goals. So it was not as well uh, provided for as, as many uh, natural history pursuits, really. Uh, more for the student, really, but with keys and ideas for projects and things in the Naturalist Handbook uh, series by Margaret Redfern and Dick Askew. Uh, there's that one for, for that side of things, really. Um, not just for goals, but for anything basically you can find on plants, really, uh, whether it's the fungi, the leaf mines caused by various insects. Um, is It's a Dutch site, um, Plant Parasites of Europe, but again, it's, it, there is an English version of it. And again, it's a question of going, clicking on host, going through the genus of the different plants that you found the gall on, or the or you can also, or leaf mine or fungus on, and you can work through and it'll tell you what it is. An amazing site resort. If there's something you found on the plant, you're not sure what it is, this is the site really to, to do that for you. We mentioned with the fungi that some of the life cycles are quite uh, uh, extended and, and different stages and things. And the same applies to things like the gall wasps. Um, they alternate between having a sexual stage and a non-sexual or a garment stage. So um, early in the year, there, there are males and females um, who mate and then they lay eggs. The, the second stage, there's only females produced, but they lay eggs that will produce young uh, just from an infant unfertilized eggs. So things like your marble gall, which is a very common one, you're probably aware of these hard galls on oaks, um, is one that does this. But uh, with this species, um, the first stage is actually on turkey oak. So it needs to have turkey oaks as well as, as native oaks around um, to, for the, for the, to complete its life cycle. Um, so that's one of the reasons that you, the number of galls vary from year to year because there's complication with the different parts of the life cycle. Another example of this and why early um, plant gall uh, people thought they were different species. We've got on the left here is one called the current gall, which actually occurs on the catkins and looks so different to the common spangle gall, which you get under the leaves later in the year. So there's quite a, a difference, but it is the same species, just the two different forms of it. Um, we mentioned the marble gall there. It says, again, there's the lava inside this hard gall. But again, like this and several others that have uh, been uh, introduced into Britain fairly recently or made it on their own. Again, there are several in that category that need both the native oaks, but also turkey oak, oak as part of their life cycle. I was thought the marble gall was probably introduced in the 19th century as a sort of tannin. It's not the richest in tannin, it's probably about 16% tannin within those galls. Things like the Aleppo gall is sort of 80-90% Mediterranean species, which is better, but you could make get tannin from those galls uh, to treat your leather. Uh, mentioned the spangle galls, it's not just the common spangle gall. Uh, there's one called the silk button gall, um, which if you look really closely, it looks like silk in this sort of round button shape. Right? But uh, with this species, it can vary very massively from year to year. Uh, this year, there's been hardly any of these in my area, whereas in 2021, almost every oak leaf was, was like that, just completely full of them. It varies uh, dramatically year to year. But part of that is, is this double life cycle, um, but also they've got to try and time it right. 
So the the the, the, the getting the process when the uh, cells of the plant are just starting to divide and at the right time for them to start this process. Um, there is another spangle gall called a smooth spangle gall. It's sort of white, originally white, it's called alpapies, but it eventually does go red, but that's a smoother species compared to these other ones. Uh, some of the other uh, oak galls, artichoke gall is on the bud and it does look a little bit like an artichoke, so that's where it gets its name. Uh, the Napa gall is a fairly recent in introduction, probably in the 1980s into Britain, um, but has this knobbly effect on, on, the, on the acorns. Uh, under the leaves, you can find things like the red pea gall, uh, which starts off green, but eventually goes red. And there's one called the cola nut. The cola nut is actually a, an African plant and is actually the flavoring for your cola drinks, Coca-Cola, etc. cetera. Um, but this uh, gall looks a bit like those nuts and that's where it gets its name. Again, it, it can be fairly widespread on, on, on oaks as any of these four can really. On roses, of course, you get the bedaguar or Robin's pincushion gall. Again, it's caused by a gall wasp. Uh, but in the case of this one, um, you very rarely find males. It tends to be females, but the females can lay eggs and they can be fertile. So it's a situation where in many respects, the male is becoming redundant in this species. So it may come to a point where you just can't find males. But of course, if the uh, conditions change, that genetic uh, diversity is gone by not having the males and having this... Uh, recombination of genes um, but this is a species where um, it is tending towards females only. Uh, the sawflies uh, used to be called Pontania, they're now in the genus uh, Eura, Eura. Um, but they cause the bean galls so if you look at any willow tree you find these red sort of bean-like structures on them um, but on the different species of willow uh, they're slightly different each one has a slightly different um, gall and for some um, species you can go across a couple of the, the uh, species and hybrids but a lot of them are specific to one plant uh, one willow species so with the creeping willow for example it's quite distinct so you know which species it is in, in that case once you know the willow species um, they will also occur on some of the hybrid willows as well and it can be can be confusing then which of them it, it actually can, it is on sycamore or lime, you can see these what are called nail galls. And again, there's a range of things uh, in two generations in area five mites. So on sycamore, they're very common. There's a couple of species you can find. You get them on lime. Uh, some are short, some are longer, like these ones. Even on exotic things like silver lime, there's a species I've found on a, on a local tree that's in this group, but I haven't worked out exactly which one that is uh, for that European species. Uh, uh, the mites also cause two forms of galls, really. Um, what are called blister galls, like this one here, just form a little blister on the surface of the leaf. And the other group called it, have the little hairs, the felty, what's called a rhinium, made of these little hairs. Um, so on alder, you get this species, Acolysis. On walnut, these bulges, uh, green on the top surface, but the rhinium with the mites is underneath there. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever seen wild thyme that seems to have these strange white uh, hairy um, um, buds instead of proper buds. There's these strange growths. Now these are actually um, caused by little tiny mite. And again, they're uh, in amongst the, these little tiny hairs feeding on the plant, but that's, Looks quite pretty, really, that one compared to some of the other galls. But um, in if you've got masses wild thyme and there's a lot of this, it can be it can almost look like snow on the ground with all these tiny little galls. Um, aphids will produce uh, galls in some situations, uh, mostly on shrubs and trees rather than on uh, herbaceous plants for the most part, really. Um, but they're different in that they um, you get different stages within the gall. So with aphids, um, you can get from little tiny nymphs to adults within a single gall. Uh, this one's on red currant. Again, a, 
a surface yellow green on the top and red below with the little tiny um, aphids crawling around. On things like poplars, black and lumber on body poplar, uh, there's two pemphigus um, aphid galls. Spirotheca has a spiral shape, so the three spirals, whereas Bersarius has a single gall. Again, these will alternate. In the case of these uh, aphids, they're alternating between the poplar trees in the spring and early summer. And then later in the year, they're going on the roots of either lettuce or south thistle. And then they produce, they lay eggs onto the poplar, uh, poplar trees bark and they hatch in the spring and start the cycle all over again. Uh, the psyllids or jumping plant lice look a bit like aphids. They're quite tiny uh, plant juice sucking animals. Uh, Salopsis fraxini uh, causes uh, this leaf um, curl, but has this lovely purple sort of patterning on it at the edge of an ash uh, leaf. Um, but it's not just trees and shrubs and dicotyledonous plants that have galls. Some of the modern cotyledons, like this rush, can have what's called a tassel gall. Instead of a seed head, it's got these little tassels inside there. Uh, is one of these psyllids. Um, the gall midges, the flies, can produce uh, a whole range of different forms on different uh, plant species. And again, these can vary massively from year to year in, in terms of numbers. In my area, a few years ago, amphibious bistort, almost every plant would have this gall on the edge here. Great name, Wax liella persicariae. Um, many south thistles will have this one called Cystiphora sunshine. This is the red and uh, orangey cream spot on the leaf. Some of these can actually uh, uh, affect the flowers as well. So in tufted vetch, you can get this one called Contor uh, Contorinia cracker. Um, which forms, instead of a proper flower developing, you get this bulging purple mass with a little tiny fly larva inside. Uh, wild carrots can have these sort of pinky hairy uh, circles on, on the flower head. It's uh, Kifaria pericarpicola. Um, and even on things like stinging nettle, there's the little uh, gall midge, Dacinura etica, on the edge of the leaf, this red with little spikes on. Uh, well, these are fairly common, you can find most of those quite readily. Uh, some of the fungal galls, Tafrina is a group, um, my favourite in this group really is the alder tongue. And it does look a bit like a tongue, it's red and it sticks out a bit like a tongue. Uh, it starts off green but eventually goes black and you find these on alder cones. And that seems to be spreading, it's on the native alder but also you'll get it on uh, the introduced grey and Italian alders as well. So with those species being planted in urban areas, you can even get it in urban areas as well. Uh, on the hybrid black poplars, you can get this Tafrina populina, yellow green bulge on the top, and then the little orange spores below. Uh, another favorite of mine, and again, one that massively uh, alternates the, um, in terms of numbers from year to year, uh, a couple of years ago, this there was a situation where there was hardly any fruit on the blackthorn. There was all these uh, pocket plums. And of course, it's called pocket plum because it's actually hollow inside. Uh, it's hijacked the, the fruit growing. And so it gives a big surface inside, produce the spores for the next generation. We tend to get large numbers in, in a damp year. If it's a dry year like this, this last year, I hardly saw, only saw one or two really there's hardly any it's most common in sort of may june period perhaps into july um that's one of my favorites but you can see it's because of the uh function of the the gall in, in hijacking it it's and also bringing some of the nutrients the pocket plum is is actually way bigger than the fruit itself at that stage uh, I'll do just a little bit on some of the culture and economical, uh, not economical goals that there are. Uh, worldwide, I mean, there's been tons and tons of uh, goals from oaks used to make tannin to produce the le leather. Uh, that's also why some of the species we've got on oak in this country were introduced from Europe. Um, so that was one of the main uses for, for goals. 
Um, but also, it's also used for ink. Um, it was often, say, 500 years ago, it was used quite commonly, generally. Um, but it was also used till fairly recently on, on banknotes. And in the Victorian times, up to 20 gallons of ink uh, were used in the Bank of England for, to make banknotes. It was actually made from the, or, uh, from the um, ink from uh, oak galls. But also it can have uh, very negative effects. Ergot or Claviceps purpurea is a, is a gall fo uh, formed by the smut fungus. And you find it on cereals. And in the medieval period, hundreds, maybe thousands of people would be dying this, what was called ergotism, also called holy fire. And because St. Anthony supposedly could cure people of it, sometimes called St. Anthony's fire as well. But it can cause death. Uh, better screening and preparation of seeds and things in farming has meant that it's, it's unlikely for that to happen nowadays. But on, on wild members of the grass family, you can still see it quite commonly on salt marshes and places like that on the grasses there. You can often find the yeah, ergot. Um, does anyone remember those jumping beans they used to be? Uh, they're actually a type of gall. Again, it was a larva. Uh, inside a hardened gall and of course with the larva being active inside that it make the the bean jump and surprisingly some of the galls are used as food uh, we mentioned about the corn or maize smut uh, in Central America though it's called ambrosia of the Aztecs and it's considered a delicacy the Central American name is Hutilala uh in Central America it doesn't look appetizing but they seem to, to love that I mentioned that so the galls can act as uh, physiological sinks. And we saw with the um, on the blackthorn that the um, fruit was smaller than the gall because it was it was drawing in all the nutrients the were. Um, most galls don't really affect the plant too much on a lot of the trees and things. It's not that much, but it can locally affect uh, and certainly for farmers and things or if it's, it's quite widespread, it's, it can be an effect. But for the vast majority of plants, it's not going to be that major factor on them, really. Uh, they date back probably something like 302 million years. The first fossil one was actually on a tree fern. So you can get galls on things like seaweeds. You can get them on ferns as well as the other plants as well. Um, the insect one's probably from 150 million years ago, but some like the true gall was probably only 30 million years old. Uh, the study of plant galls is cacodology, and the word for a gall is also cacidium. And they derived from the Greek word kekis, which means a nut growing or oozing out uh, from or gushing out. And that's also almost certainly where we get the link to sort of the gall bladder oozing gall or bile. So it's the name origin is from the same thing having a gall inside a human is because is, it looks similar to those, especially those that produce the inks and things and the tannin, the materials for tannins, where it gets the origin of that name. The Latin galleries and then into English is for basically in the excrescence on the tree is where it gets that name. So that's it. Um, I will end that and we'll stop sharing. Um, Well, thank, thank you very much, Steve.